Okay, welcome to lesson five, where we look at natural selection. And I will continue to discuss some of the content and concepts that we talked about in lesson four yesterday with regards to the origin of species, uh, where we look at the idea that evolution occurs when nature selects specific genetic traits or variations of that species. Uh, and that selection of those traits allows for uh, a, that species to adapt and, and propagate. And then that cycle continues over a very long period of time. Uh, we're going to look at some of the specific concepts and details that revolve around those selection processes, um, mainly the idea of natural selection and selective pressure. So selection occurs as a result of many different factors. It's not just something that uh, happens in a bubble. There are a lot of things that contribute to it, both at the, the macro level, at the large scale, and at the micro level on the genetic scale. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today and tomorrow. So when we look at selective pressures, uh, it's those many factors that I, I mentioned just a couple seconds ago. And there are different selective pressures that result in different patterns of natural selection. Uh, some examples of natural, or sorry, some examples of selective pressures might be the amount or the type of predators, the uh, food sources that are available, different types of diseases that may or may not happen. And all of these contribute to it. So when we look at Darwin's five principles of natural selection. What we're really talking about here is the idea that there are individuals within a population that differ from one another, that genetic and physical difference. Uh, there are differences that, that exist. They are heritable and they're able to be passed on. The individuals uh, that are successful at passing on their genes have a higher chance of survival and, and they are more likely to create offspring that have that similar higher chance of survival and the ability to reproduce over a long period of time through multiple generations, uh, that difference in fitness, if you will. And I'll just highlight that there because that's important. Um, when we look at the successful uh, individuals within a species, they succeed because they have trait, a trait or traits that basically give them an upper hand with regards to the environment that they live in. Yesterday we talked about humanity being able to stand upright or any ape-like species being able to stand upright to see over that savanna and see where their predators are coming, see where their prey are. And those that didn't have that ability uh, were unable to pass on their genetic traits through reproduction. So the main idea here being that these advantageous traits are, are going to be passed on to offspring over time. And then that, that over time of, of those four main principles leads to a population changing over time and the different frequency of traits. You'll start to notice that as we look at specific examples and we look at the history of their evolution, you're gonna see that different traits come and go and it really depends on what is uh, allowing for that successful survival of that species. So an example that we've kind of talked about quite a bit in the first two units and that we will continue to discuss in this unit as well as next unit even, uh, is the idea of sickle cell anemia. And when we look at that single base pair mutation, that substitution error, if you will, that leads to sickle cell anemia. It, it usually happens in areas where, where that sickle cell allele is found. It's usually happening in areas where malaria is present. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I thought sickle cell was a response to the malaria and it allowed for that adaptation for humans to not be affected by malaria. Well, it, again, it's such a multifaceted and, and so many variables that contribute to the idea of change and adaptation, but it's ultimately where malaria is present, the sickle cell allele is, is often found. So at the end of the day, they kind of work together. So people with the allele for sickle cell are more likely to survive. And as a result of that ability to survive and reproduce, they're gonna pass on those alleles. So this is a successful adaptation that when you look at where malaria shows up most, uh, the sickle cell trait tends to also show up. So when we look at the types of, of selection, this is probably the most important thing for this unit in terms of specifics. Uh, you're gonna probably utilize some of these concepts with regards to your essay or your research article once you start writing that. Uh, but these three types of selections are, are gonna be crucial for your understanding with regards to adaptations and evolution as a whole in this unit. So directional selection is a trait uh, on one extreme that is favored, so long tails, are favored over short or medium tails. 
a stabilizing selection, which is the average or medium phenotype is favored. For example, human birth weight, we favor the middle weight. If you're too small, you're less likely to survive. If you're too large, you're also less likely to survive. If that average uh, weight and size of a human being allows for the maximum survivability of that individual. And then lastly, disruptive selection, where both extremes of a trait are favored over the middle or average phenotype. For example, a very short or very long tail in some species are favored over a medium tail. So let's look at some of the specifics with regards to that. Uh, as I said, with regards to directional selection, one extreme is favored. The average length of tail, for example, is more likely to be longer in a species that, dis, uh, that um, shows directional selection. So for example, a long wiggly tail tends to look like a snake and that tends to scare predators that are afraid of snakes. So the longer the tail, the more it looks like a snake and then that will be a survivability adaptation. With regards to that stabilizing selection, we talked about it in humans, but in this example, when we talk about it in terms of cats, it, if it, the tail is too short, then they're unable to, to balance properly and they're not as agile. They're gonna suffer when it comes to hunting. A shorter tail means less successful hunts, less successful hunt means less food. So that's a trait that will be kind of selected out over a long period of time because it doesn't lead to an adaptation that allows for survivability. Likewise, long tails in this example, they drag on the ground, they reduce the amount of speed you can get up, um, they can get damaged, lead to infections, so that long tail is also an adaptation that really doesn't help to provide um, a benefit for that cat to hunt. So an average size tail, which has the right amount of size in terms of length to allow for that balance and that stability when it comes to hunting, but it's not so long that it's going to uh, be a detriment to their ability to survive. And then lastly, when we look at uh, disruptive selection, the extremes are favored in both populations. So you're not really going to see a population with the average, in this example, tail length. You're not going to see the average tail length showing up. You're going to see very, very short tails or very, very long tails in this successful population because short tails help to keep predators from catching them. Uh, it's less of a, 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 a draw to the eye for predators, so they're less likely to be hunted but likewise, long tails are also good for balance when uh, climbing through the trees. This is with regards to squirrels. So having that longer tail might help in balancing and moving and, and, and what have you, but also having that shorter tail helps not draw predators to you. So you're gonna see a skew of either short tails or long tails and nothing really in the average because again, that green line shaded is the evolved population. The dotted line is what the species used to be, quote unquote. And then, so that average, in this example of disruptive selection, the average gets eliminated because it's either not long enough to help with balance or it's just long enough for them to get caught by predators. And as a result of that, we see those populations change. Uh, these are the three main examples of selection. You're 100% gonna have to know this stuff. Even if I'm not testing you on it for this stuff, you're gonna need it for your probably your lab quiz. You're definitely gonna need it for your research article. And uh, honestly, whatever we decide with regards to the final summative, it's gonna be a large component of it as well. So it behooves you to understand what three, these three different types of selection processes are. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about sexual selection because um, a lot of the selective pressures and a lot of the adaptations uh, come as a result from the ability that the species garners from being able to successfully draw a mate. So sexual selection is caused by the difference of reproductive successes caused by a variation of mates in the population. It affects the ability of individuals to find mates, which in turn affects fitness as well as reproductive success. So when we look at some examples of competition between individuals, uh, any male or female that's able to successfully fight is uh, showing the ability to survive and that show ability to survive leads means that they have a higher fitness and if they have a higher fitness they're going to be more likely to reproduce and then when it comes to dimorphism when we look at males and females looking differently often it has to do with their colors it can be with regards to shape and size as well but usually in majority of species it has to do with different colors so females can then select and breed with brightly colored males 
And males can look to increase the intensity of that trait over time by also mating with more colorful females because again, depending on the type of species, um, but again, it really matters how bright their colors are. You see it in a lot of birds, you see it in a lot of uh, ape species, a lot of um, fish species as well. So to summarize the idea that uh, you're trying to increase the amount of fitness for a specific environment, if you increase the amount of fitness, whether it be an adaptation through a trait or what have you, uh, the species tends to become more frequent in that population as a result of that adaptation or that trait, and then that population has that trait more frequently. Okay, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. And um, I'm probably going to post a new video with regards to the research assignment tomorrow because you're going to be working on your lab tomorrow and Thursday. So I'll probably make a video with regards to some more specifics of that research assignment. Uh, I hope my post today in classroom answered a lot of the questions that people had about the research article. And I'm going to post a new um, question slash check in, if you will, on classroom to do the Google form to kind of give you all some uh, ability to share what you've done and what you need to do still with me. Uh, otherwise, like I said, if you have questions, you know where to find me.